My name is Hannah, Hannah Wake. I'm 66 years old. And in 1981, October the 20th, when I was 31 years old, and the mother of an 11-month-old baby, I drove the getaway car in a, in a robbery in which two policemen and a security guard were killed. And each of those victims were husbands and fathers, and they left grieving wives, children, extended family, and a traumatized community. And at my trial, two of my co-defendants and myself, we claimed to be political prisoners, and we refused to participate in the proceedings. So um, while I sat in a basement holding cell, unrepresented, I was sentenced to 75 years to life, which is in effect a life sentence. Um, I was transported to a maximum security prison for women, and I've been there ever since. And it took me two years to shed the armor of my political prisoner identity. And I began to reckon with the horror of my crime and the suffering I caused. And my life for the last 30 years has really been defined by that reckoning. And my efforts to repair my relationship with my family, particularly with my daughter. Um, shall I go on? When I was first transported to this prison after being arrested um, and sentenced, the state trooper announced over the two-way radio, this is where you will die. Okay, let's start that again. I think the policeman is the state trooper. Oh, yeah. When I was first transported to this prison and um, I'd been sentenced, uh, the policeman said over the two-way radio, this is where you will die. The air of prison, um, it's saturated with punishment and retribution. Uh, a woman enters this world um, no, she's not shuffling in leg irons and... Do I have to cut that bit out? Um, when you come into prison, you're, you're stripped of all your trappings, all your clothes, your property, your personal photographs, um, even your name, and you're given a number and a uniform and a rule book. And all the complexity of your identity and your past and your history, they're, they're just reduced to a number. You're an offender, that's it. That is your identity. And when you go to the parole board after 20 or 25 years, or 30 years, um, when you've aged from the cocky young person you were when you first came in, um, into a menopausal woman, um, they might take note of your good behavior and uh, all the education you've given yourself and the vocational training you've volunteered for, and your um, certificates of education or graduation, um, and all your letters of recommendation. They'll take them into consideration, but they're still their decision will most likely rest on the nature of your crime. And that's the one thing that you can never change. So um, most long-termers who finally get to a board will be told they have to serve more time because releasing them would, would somehow minimize the seriousness of their crime. Um, Doing time is, is how we pay for our crimes. So the worse the crime, the longer the time, that's the theory. And 
each year slowly shifts into another one and the, at that, uh, no, um, sorry, I didn't read that sentence right. Um, each year that you serve, it slowly shifts the scales of justice. Um, but when the crime is serious, when a, a human life has been taken, um, well, how long is enough? When years become numbers, 10, 20, 50, how can that ever come close to balancing the loss of a human life? The pain of crime victims is translated into more years, harsher regimes, um, and pain and suffering are assuaged by the perpetrator's pain and suffering, or is it? Over the years I've been questioning um, my belief in political violence. I firmly believed in it when I came in and um, now I'm not at all sure about it. Um, and I began to see a parallel between my dream of revolutionary violence and which was a way to answer repressive political violence, um, that of large powerful governments um, and I began to see a parallel between that and the punitive policies and rhetoric of the war on crime in the criminal justice system and later in my work with with young mothers I, I've often found a, a similar dynamic where women who as youngsters had suffered physical and sexual abuse at the hands of adults um, compensated for their sense of powerless and shame by identifying with their aggressors and um, aligning themselves with bullies or becoming bullies themselves and we wall ourselves up um, we wall ourselves uh, against the violence in the prison itself as a sort of protection from vulnerability nobody wants to sh show their vulnerability so it's a very extreme version of the outside world. Um, my own shift towards remorse and um, forgiveness of myself, really, um, was a change of heart and soul, really. Um, more, more than a change of my mind or my politics, um, it was hard to describe this I internal shift. Um, I suppose it sprung from the fact that I slowly rebuilt my relationship with my parents, um, who I'd been estranged from for years, and, um, and my friends who, who were alienated by my actions. Um, and I apologised, and I, and I thanked people, and I cried, and I asked for help, and um, I conversed with the officers, um, and I and I showed that I understood the difficulties of their job. They're locked in here as well, um, and I. I, I reconnected to, um, to bits of myself who, which I'd rejected. Um, my, my intellectualism, my, um, my Jewishness, my fear, um, my longing for intimacy. It, 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 it was as though judgment had, judgment had, had given way to empathy and um, 
the world that had been black and white to me um, became multicolored and mysterious and complex and, and part of an interconnected universe. And, um, and I got involved in um, teaching, mentoring, um, and particularly in this area of drama where I'd done some Shakespeare workshops with visiting professionals and I developed a great passion for this work and how Shakespeare seems to give a voice to um, so many of our extreme predicaments. Um, and somehow or other I, I, I managed to galvanize a lot of the women to take part in um, what has been a very purgative exercise for all of us, I think. Um, and I began to see a line through the Shakespeare plays that we've been tackling that um, aligned with my own story in a certain way in that um, the politics and the violence of Julius Caesar reflected my, my early beliefs and my struggles with um, destroying one set of violent circumstances and replacing them with another. And that chimed uh, not only with me, I think with many of the other women, and um, perhaps not in such an extreme way as my personal history made the connection with, but um, then we went on to explore Henry the Fourth, which which had all sorts of um, other connections for the women in um, in the experience of addiction and being controlled by people within the prison, um, and relationships being about that kind of control, which was sort of acted out through false staff and Henry the Fourth fighting over the the future of this young young potential person, which uh, is very much my mission to, to get the young women in here, out there, um, to take something positive with them and to hothouse them, really, <laughs> grow their self-esteem, take it out into the world. That's a bit of a mission of mine, but it's the next best thing to myself going out there and makes some sense of my own incarceration in some way. Um, and now in, in The Tempest, which is about, it is about the theme of retribution and revenge and getting rid of, um, getting rid of the anger, self-hatred, the punishment inside yourself that you either want to inflict on yourself or, or on your um, people outside, people outside in the world that um, you don't actually have any power over, but somehow in this play we have imagined that the people who are shipwrecked on the island who have wronged Prospero are, are um, any one of our um, confederates on the outside who seem to have had an easier life, perhaps. Um, but I, uh, it's been very hard work, but perhaps uh, 30 years in, in, in an institution like this has given me access to um, time for solitary reflection, um, time for study, um, and maybe it's an advantage I've got in here of, um, that I've moved on to uh, meditation the study of Judaism, Buddhism, various disciplines like that, um, which have radically changed my interior and um, got me to a place where I can, in my old age, let things go, let go of that anger. And it's taken a long time, but Every day has not been about struggle. Every day um, has had light in it, um, as well as dark. 
and I came to realise that, um, well, I read a lot about revenge and um, uh, George Orwell wrote um, that revenge is an act that you want to commit when you're powerless, but that as, as, soon, as, as soon as that sense of impotence goes, you no longer need or have the desire for revenge. And I think that is quite true. And in the play itself, Prospero says, um, uh, the rarer act is in virtue than in vengeance. Um, and those things seem to strike deep notes in me without in any way wanting to sound like I've cracked it or <laughs> I'm holier than thou, but um, these threads of thought have been incredibly powerful in my life and I'm amazed at how Shakespeare seems to have written that story for me. <laughs> <laughs>